Good morning. It is Wednesday, May the 6th. Let's gather together and let's uh, study God's Word together. Uh, we're going to begin this morning in Matthew chapter 20, our New Testament reading. Matthew chapter 20. It's still Sheep Week, and uh, we're going to talk still some more about shepherds and sheep. But Matthew chapter 20, beginning in verse 17. While going up to Jerusalem, Jesus took the twelve disciples aside privately and said to them on the way, See, we're going up to Jerusalem. The Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death. They will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked, flogged, and crucified, and on the third day he will be raised. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons, now that's James and John, the mother of Zebedee's sons, their mama, approached him with her sons. She knelt down to ask Jesus for something. What do you want? He asked of her. Promise, she said to him, that these two sons of mine may sit, one on your right and the other on your left, in your kingdom. I think Jewish people call this chutzpah. This is, this is nerve. This is gall. This mama, she's dragging her boys with her. I mean, my goodness. Uh, these are grown men. And she's she's got them in tow. And we don't even know which is worse. Is it that the mama is dragging them along, sort of uh, uh, weakening them, portraying them as weak? Or is it that they're just being manipulative? Hey, mama, you go talk to Jesus. Mama, see if you can get something out of it. I mean, it's I, this has just got bad written all over it, as we say uh, down in lower Alabama where I'm from. Um Good grief, coming to Jesus and going ahead and making a reservation. Just make a reservation. The the most prestigious spots in the entire kingdom. Let's reserve them for James and John. Verse 22, Jesus answered, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink? Now, what is the cup? Well, he just told them. That's in verse 19. The cup is this cup of suffering that he's about to receive. This is probably an indirect reference, a cup. What is a cup got? It's because in the Passover celebration, there are four cups, and they have different names. One of them is the cup of suffering. Another is a cup of redemption. We think the cup of redemption is the one that Jesus held up in the Passover celebration and said, this is my blood, which is poured out for you. He reinterpreted it. So here, a, the, a reference to a cup here is probably the cup of suffering. And um, they say, naively, how many of us have done this? Oh, sure, we'll do it. We're able. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, okay. Uh, you say that you are. And then Jesus told them, you indeed will drink my cup, but to sit at my right and left hand is not mine to give. So there is suffering. Jesus knows, he knows all things, and he knows that something will come of their lives. Uh, John probably is going to live to a ripe old age, the only apostle to die of old age, but he's going to be persecuted and have difficulties for much of his life. And James is going to be the very first one to be executed among the disciples. So yes, you will drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand or my left is not mine to give. Well, whose is it? He says, it is for those to whom it has been prepared by my Father. It is God Almighty, the Father who will uh, designate these spots of right and left of Jesus. Well, we're not done with fussing. Man, oh man. Verse 24, when the 10, the other 10 disciples heard about this, they became indignant. They're mad. 
with the two brothers, James and John. And Jesus now, as he so often does, he's got to intervene to bust these guys up and calm them down. And he reminds them that we're under Roman occupation. And what do Romans do to us? They bully us. So look at what he says in verse 25. Jesus called them over and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them. They love being in charge, bossing and bullying. And those in high positions act as tyrants over them. But it must not be like that among you. On the contrary, whoever wants to be great among you, well, what is great? That's the ones who get to sit in the right and the left side of Jesus. That's great. Those are the highest positions. Jesus says, you want those positions? Well, then you need to become a servant. Verse 27, and whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Now, um, I have uh, in this Bible, this is the Christian Standard Bible, and many Bibles have, have headings. The heading, paragraph headings are not in the original Bible. These are just part of modern day Bibles to help orient the reader as to what we're talking about. And so in this, it says at verse 17, where we begin, the third prediction of his death. Now that ought to raise an eyebrow. The third prediction of his death, and yet it caught him by surprise when he died. He prepared them over and over and over again that Jesus would suffer, he would die, and that he would ra be raised again. And when the moment came, they were clueless, which makes you wonder if there's maybe a certain level of hard-headedness among them. And I can pretend like I'm not hard-headed, but yet there have been times when I've been slow to grasp and understand what Jesus wants from me and what he wants to do in me. And I predict the same is true for you as well. Let's don't come down too hard on these apostles. But they also, it wasn't until after the resurrection that they began to understand a lot of these truths. Well, speaking of hard-headedness, let's go back now to the Old Testament reading, Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah chapter 23. Now, Jeremiah and Ezekiel overlap each other. Ezekiel did not begin his ministry until after the Babylonian army came in and killed a bunch of Jews, Hebrews, and then hauled them off into captivity. Jeremiah was on the other side of that. He was there before the army came, and he was there when it arrived and continued to preach after they took over and wiped out the place. So Jeremiah preached for approximately 40 years, but he's, on, he's, before, be, he's before the army comes in. So listen to what um, Jeremiah says, 23 verse 1. Woe to the shepherds. Well, that's what Ezekiel said. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture. This is the Lord's declaration. Therefore, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says about the shepherds who tend my sheep. You have scattered my flock, banished them, and have not attended to them. I'm about to attend to you because of your evil acts. This is the Lord's declaration. Wow, wow, wow. Y'all ever, um, you, you, just by chance, none of you have ever said maybe on a long trip to the, to the kids, um, listen, y'all better work it out if you don't, I'm going to come work it out for you. 
Are you, has anybody ever said something like that? Did you know that you were being biblical when you said that? Because God is the one who said it first. Look at it. It's right here in Jeremiah chapter 23. You did not attend to my sheep. So I'm about to attend to you. <laughs> my goodness alive. Wow. This is serious. God warned these people that judgment was coming. And then he shifts in verse 3. He begins to prophesy about the future. This is, this is later, either during the Babylonian captivity or long after. Look at what he says. He says, verse 3, I will gather the remnant of my flock. So this is after the captivity. From all of the lands where I have banished them, and I will return them to their grazing land. They will become fruitful and numerous. I will raise up shepherds over them who will tend them. Now, this is different from Ezekiel. Remember, when in Ezekiel's passage, he said, I will raise up a shepherd. I will shepherd my people. But here, it's plural. I will raise up shepherds. So there will be some godly people that God will raise up to help love and care for the flock of his pastor, his people. They will no longer be afraid or discouraged, nor will there be any missing. This is the Lord's declaration. And now we're shifting way into the future with a messianic prophecy in verse 5. Look, the days are coming. This is the Lord's declaration. When I will raise up a righteous branch for David. So you imagine uh, if a person's like a tree uh, and then descendants are like branches that go out. Well, someone, a righteous branch is a descendant of King David. This person will reign wisely as king and administer justice and righteousness in the land. In his day, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell securely. This was when the nation of Israel was divided into two kingdoms because of a civil war, northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. And this is the name he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. Look, the days are coming. The Lord's declaration when it will no longer be said, as the Lord lives, who brought the Israelites from the land of Egypt. But, instead, as the Lord lives, who brought and led the descendants of the house of Israel from the land of the north and from all the other companies where he had banished them, they will dwell once more in their land. Now, I want to comment a little bit on overall on this passage. Uh, I've already made a connection between Ezekiel and Jeremiah. The problem with the way these, these scripture passages panned out in the lectionary reading is that chronologically they're backwards, okay, because Jeremiah comes first. So therefore, if we could reverse the order and remember what we talked about, God is judging in Jeremiah. He is judging the shepherds. The shepherds don't take take care of the sheep. They eat sheep. They destroy sheep. They don't attend to sheep. These are the leaders of God's people. They have not served God's people well. Then the Babylonian army comes in, wipes out the place, and hauls off people into captivity. Exactly what Jeremiah and other prophets predicted was going to happen. Destruction's going to come, here it is. If that were to happen to you, what do you think would be your response? Wow, Jeremiah was right. We need to get right with God. We need to repent and get right with God. That is not what happened. Not right away. No, no, no. In fact, you then go to Ezekiel. Now the destruction has come. They are in Babylon. And what's happening in Babylon? 
the same thing. The shepherds are abusing the people, abusing their authority, eating sheep, bullying sheep. It's the Repentance is not going to come until 70 years. It just shows the hard-headedness of humanity. But let's go to the end of this, this messianic prophecy, because there's something very interesting about this. So you have to look at verse 7 and 8 again. God says, the day is coming when you, my people, are going to change your language. In verse 7, you used to say, as the Lord lives who brought the Israelites out of the land of Egypt. That's just, that was a common Jewish expression. As the Lord lives who brought his people out of Egypt, I'm going to buy a car next week. I'm going to sell a piece of property. It was, it was just a way of talking. It was, it, it was a, a way of expressing surety. I'm sure of something. Just as you can count on the fact that God brought his people out of Egypt, so this new thing is going to happen. God says, he's prophesying about the future. Y'all are going to quit talking like that. You're going to say something new. As surely, verse 8, as the Lord lives, who brought the de and led the descendants of the house of Israel out of the land of the north. That's Babylon. So God is making a messianic prophecy that the day will come in the future when you will no longer talk about what God did for grandma, grandpa, and ancestors. Not that that's not important and not that it's not worth remembering. But there's a transform, a fundamental transformation that is going to happen. You're going to quit talking about your grandparents and your ancestors' faith and what God did in their lives, and you're going to start talking about what God has done in your life. And friends, I want to tell you, God does that same transformation even now. Even now. I have met people that talk and talk and talk about what their parents did in a church and how their parents built this and how God did this with them. And friends, I celebrate with them. I am not putting that down. But you know what I want to hear about? I want to hear about what God's been doing lately. What's God been doing in your life? Thank God for grandma and grandpa. But you need your own faith. You can't live off grandma and grandpa's faith. You need your faith. I want to know what God's been doing in your life. How has, how has the fruit of the Spirit been manifesting in your life? How many people have come to the Lord and to the life of the church through your ministry? How have you served? This is not about bragging about yourself. It's about acknowledging the mercy, grace, and power of God to work in our lives. Oh, I'm telling you, friends. God is all about transforming people's lives. You're going to quit talking about what God did through our ancestors, and you're going to begin to talk about what I've done in your life. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, I thank you so much for... I thank you for our ancestors, Lord. I thank you for their faithfulness. I thank you for the hard work, their sacrificial giving that all made the possibilities of the churches that we worship in. It made it possible. Somebody had to make those kind of sacrifices. Somebody had to volunteer and give of themselves to make it happen. And we're the beneficiaries. We're not, we're not uh, closed off and closed-minded. We know, Lord, we stand on the shoulders of giants. We're so thankful for their love. But, Lord, we live in a new day now. And so I'm praying that for every person under the sound of my voice that we would begin to catch a, a vision for what you want to do now, what you want to do in us and through us new ministries that will happen 
Lord, I, I just believe there's going to be new ministries that rise up in our church. I'm, I'm believing them even though we're shut down. Just like you spoke about a day in the future when it hadn't happened yet. Lord, I, I believe that there are new things you're going to be leading our church in. And I want to be a part of it. And I know there are others that want to be a part of it too, Lord. So give us humble servant hearts that seek to build up the kingdom. For we pray this, rejoicing in the name of the person that makes it all possible. In the name of Jesus, amen and amen. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up higher and higher, and he shall lift you up. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. Thyself in the sight of the Lord, and He shall lift you up higher and higher, and He shall lift you up. Walk now in humility, be the person that God wants you to be the servant in his flock. In Jesus' name, amen.